The interaction between our microbial genes uh, and our human genes on what to worry about and what not to worry about is probably the biggest way that they're affecting our health. Controlling our immune systems and our immune systems reactions to other things. We had assumed that our immune systems decided what to attack and what not to attack based on whether it was part of us or not. But the fact that we don't attack things that aren't part of us or shouldn't attack things that aren't part of us like pollen um, or the food we eat, that's not part of us but our immune systems shouldn't normally react, suggests that actually there's a more sophisticated way of telling what's worth attacking and what's um, worth just ignoring. Hey folks, it's Mike Mutzel here with HighIntensityHealth.com. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We're live at episode number 107 with Alana Cohen. She's the author of this great book that uh, I read over the weekend. Hopefully you can see this here, 10% Human. It's all about gut bacteria and uh, the microbiome and, and how uh, you know, new research is showing that uh, we're only 10% human. She's going to share with us a lot of details of that. But fantastic book. As you know, we've had uh, Eric and Justin Sonnenberg on the show and Gerard Mullen and many other experts. So we want to talk to Alana and, and get her inside perspective because she has a master's degree in biology uh, and a PhD in evolutionary biology. And she has a, a very thorough background uh, in this field. So Alana, thanks for being here. Thank you very much for having me. So I think a great launching place would be that moment when you're in Malaysia, you talk about in your book and you have all, you kind of uh, go to bed at night and you have all these ticks around, maybe take us to that moment and kind of how you got down this rabbit hole of the gut bacteria. Right. So um, at that point I was working um, as a bat scientist. I was helping out another scientist with her research. And so I spent three months in the Malaysian uh, rainforest catching bats every night and recording various measurements about them and then sending them on their way. Um, and one night I came back to base camp. Um, I had a lot of bats to, to process, to measure and so on. Um, but I also had very itchy ankles and I um, stopped to check what was going on and discovered that I had been bitten by a lot of ticks. Um, and I'd apparently walked through a tick nest. So I had to deal with my bats first because they were the priority and then I removed the ticks and I was well aware that there are nasty things you can get from ticks so I kept an eye out and I subsequently became ill and um, it took me a long time to uh, get a proper diagnosis. I think probably because these ticks were in Malaysia and not in Europe so doctors didn't um, weren't familiar with the, with the symptoms and with the um, tests for, for identifying it. Mm -hmm. So um, that led me to be treated with um, a long course of antibiotics. Um, just over a year, I think I was on antibiotics. I had also been treated with them um, as a as a anti-malarial, and also because I had a bone infection in my foot after the tick bites. So I'd had antibiotics all over the place for years and years and years, and. Um, when I was finishing the antibiotics, the main major course of antibiotics, I started to notice that I was suffering from um, hay fever. I'd never had it before and I was 28 years old. I also developed eczema and I had a massive resurgence of the acne that I'd had as a teenager, except much worse. And I thought, uh, this is a bit weird. Something has changed here and I'm not very happy about it. Right. Um, so I went back to my doctor and he said, you should take antibiotics. <laughs> and I thought, really? Because I've just been on them for a long time and, and that doesn't seem to have helped. In fact, it seems to have made it worse. So at that point, I became really interested in whether um, the antibiotics had damaged my friendly bacteria as I knew them at that point. And I started to do some research and then I very quickly realized that there was a huge area of science that was opening up um, looking at whether microbes had a, an impact on our health. And um, my interest moved on from just what was going on with my skin and my hay fever to how could microbes be involved in all sorts of immune problems, autoimmune diseases, allergies, um, obesity, mental health problems. And I realized that it was just such a fascinating field. And at the time I was supposed to be writing another book, but I couldn't stop myself from researching this. So I thought I'm gonna switch over and write this instead. Oh, that's fantastic. Now, was this in like 2011, 2012 when all the human microbiome project was taking off or was this even before that? Uh, I started researching it in 2012. Okay. So th there was a nice foundation at that point. 
That's fantastic. And before we dive into the details of the book, I'm just curious, were you studying uh, any aspect of the microbiome in these um, bats down in Malaysia or no? No, no, not at all. I was studying um, evolutionary processes. So I was trying to understand um, how echolocation had evolved in bats. That's the way they um, make sounds in order to find their way around. So my work was quite different in um in my PhD, but the evolutionary aspect of it gave me, um, you know, a great insight into how we and our microbes have evolved together and how our immune systems expect their presence. Um, so that was quite useful. Mm. All right. Fantastic. So maybe let's talk about this uh, microbiome and human evolution and, and maybe start off with something that a lot of people are familiar with, the mitochondria and uh, you know cellular ATP or energy production. I think you have a nice, fascinating, I think 10 pages on this. Maybe share with us how our mitochondria come about. Yeah. So this is something that lots of people will have learned when they were doing biology at school. Um, and that's that there's if you look at each of our cells, they're full of um, smaller uh, things called organelles. And those organelles have, um, instead of just one membrane around them, they have two membranes around them. And um, that makes it seem like perhaps they were originally organisms on their own that have been engulfed into another cell. And it seems extremely likely for lots of different evolutionary reasons and lots of um, pieces of evidence suggest that those that are mitochondria, so those are the bits of our cells that organize um, energy product production from our food, um, are actually originally uh, some kind of primitive organism of their own, possibly a bacterium, possibly a, a similar um, kind of organism called an archaeon that have been absorbed in order to do that job um, on behalf of the cell. Awesome. Now, that comes up a lot, the archaea uh, versus bacteria. And I just want to, if you could kind of clarify that for our listeners, because some of the research will say, and I, I believe it's like sulfite reducing some of the methanobacter. Does that fall into the archaea? Yeah, as well? yeah the methanobacter is, a, um, is an archaeon. So archaea and bacteria are two completely different branches of the evolutionary tree. So they're as different from one another as each of them are from um, the branch that includes us, animals, and so on. Um, but they have a lot of similarities in the way they look. So originally, I think we weren't too sure that we didn't realize that they were different. And now we've, we've come to realize that they're extremely different and that they, um, they process energy in different ways. So in our guts, we have both bacteria and archaea. We seem to have, or at least we know more about the bacteria that we have. Um, yeah, and we have more of those. Uh, and then, but archaea, some of them seem to have quite important roles. So, for example, the methanobacter that you talk about, they um, reduce hydrogen and so on. So they they may be um, extremely significant for our, significant for our health as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen some of the research showing the higher levels of archaea and link it with small intestinal bacteria overgrowth and also obesity. Um, any highlights uh, from the archaea before we kind of move on that you want to share uh, in the context of health and disease? Oh, there's there's nothing that I can specifically remember about them, I'm afraid. But uh, yeah, they I know that there's some changes. There's been some changes seen in them for IBS as well. Um, but we still have a lot of figuring out to do of exactly what their role is and whether those changes upwards or downwards are, are significant. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Now, something else you talk about in the book is viruses. And you, and you talk about an Indian physician who's seen, you know, 10,000 patients and uh, overweight individuals, I believe you, you talk about how uh, these individuals in his clinic would lose weight and then gain it back. And he noticed some observation in, in chickens and their susceptibility to infection. So maybe... Uh, share with us this notion of infect obesity and viruses and the role that that might have on our body comp. Yeah, so this is a kind of incredible story about um, a guy called uh, Nick Ilderanda, who's currently the president of the Obesity Society in the US. So um, he started out maybe 20 years ago working with his father as a physician in um, Mumbai in India and um, trying to help people to lose weight. And um, they had some success. People would lose a bit of weight, but then they'd often come back and they had regained the weight or they had struggled to stick to the diet. And he found it very frustrating. Um, and he had a family friend who was a vet and 
he over dinner one night the vet was talking about this difficulty they were having because there was an outbreak of a virus of some kind in chickens and he happened to mention that before the chickens die they um gain weight which is obviously quite an unusual thing to happen in a in a um a viral illness or an infection of any kind most most often people lose weight or animals lose weight before they die so um nickel duranda was quite interested in this um this link and he investigated and discovered yes it's true the chickens did gain weight when they were infected with um with this virus which is called adenovirus 36. um actually no that one was a different one but later he um so he he dedicated his his life and his career to this moved to the states in order to um get some research funding managed to get funding to study it um he couldn't import that chicken virus because who wants to import a virus that affects chickens and right. could potentially cause obesity so he used a different virus um that was already in the states and um available to order into your lab and he discovered that that virus also um induced obesity in chickens and he then did some other tests and found that it caused weight gain in various other animals including marmosets which are primates um, again it's very we can't just start giving people viruses to see if it makes them obese because we don't have a cure it's not ethical so we don't know for absolute certain that it causes obesity in humans but we do know that um, it's more common amongst people who are overweight and obese than it is amongst people who are lean. So there's a suggestion that it's altering the way that we manage energy in our bodies. Wow, that's fascinating. Now, what do you make of this as an evolutionary biologist and have having looked at all the different you know, ways in which our modern lifestyle affects or perturbs our gut microbiome? Is, is it that maybe we don't have the bacterial diversity or... Uh, our immune tolerance has shifted, so maybe we're more susceptible to these viruses, and then they're causing us to gain weight. Or, what are your kind of big, you know, big vision thoughts on? on I mean, it, for this virus in particular, it could be it could be any number of things. It could be that we have decreased our um, our diversity in our own guts, and that, as you say, makes us more uh, susceptible to contracting it. It could be that um, that decreased diversity has altered the way our immune systems work and that makes us more susceptible to actually suffering from the effects of the virus. It could be that this virus is newly evolved um, and has suddenly started to cause problems, you know, recently or 50 years ago or whenever. And, and, uh, and that's what's changed or, um, you know, there are so many possibilities. Uh, my, my overall thought on the obesity epidemic as an evolutionary biologist is that if we are to assume that um, obesity is the result of an inbuilt need to chase food and to eat as much as possible, then we wouldn't expect it to have such massively harmful effects on our health. So I'd like to know that to, for sure that the the changes that we see in obesity aren't more of a pathological process that has been initiated by um, something pathological rather than a process that's supposed to be beneficial for us that of gaining weight and keeping ourselves safe through times of famine mm. so i'm not i'm not completely convinced that this is an evolutionarily beneficial um process that we're going through even if we are taking it to an extreme right yeah, beautifully said right there. I think our listeners are going to hit the rewind button. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so let's kind of dive into this in a little bit more depth. And you talk about uh, in, in the book. So the Human Genome Project, I think, got like 174, was it in the billions of dollars? Versus oh, well, the Human I Microbiome think, yeah. Project was like I 100. Think it was supposed to be, I think it came to $2.3 billion in the end. Um, yeah, and it took... 13 years or something like that because the technology was new and they were developing all sorts of um, new ways of doing it and during that time it it came down uh, the cost of, of um, sequencing a genome came down massively so now it's it's around a thousand dollars or under a thousand dollars um to sequence a single human genome so that's obviously made a huge difference to sequencing uh, the microbiome and uh, the human microbiome project has been able to run so successfully because of those technological um, updates. 
I see. Okay, so I guess I interpreted that wrong. So in your book, you talk about there's a huge disparity in the amount of money that's been allocated or that was allocated uh-huh. to the Human Genome Project versus a human microbiome. And basically, that's because the economies of scale, the technology is more efficient. It's not that there's a, a, a decreased emphasis on studying bacteria. Oh, no, I think, I mean, I think the first is certainly true, but the second also, um, okay. there's, you know, sequencing our own genome, what could tell us more about us than, than that? is the assumption but I think actually there's when we if you look at the things that we're suffering from and how enlightened we've become about them since sequencing the human genome well not so much there are a few things that it's made a huge difference to um, but most of the things that we suffer from especially the things that don't kill us allergies um, autoimmune diseases um, that kind of thing the human genome project hasn't really contributed to our understanding The Human Microbiome Project received so little attention in the press and um, it's arguably telling us so much more about who we are, about um, how we're suffering and about where our lives are going. Hmm. Why do you think that is? Because it's more complicated or because the onus kind of becomes uh, on us, the person, because our environment influences our our gut bacteria? What are your thoughts there? I think essentially... uh, our gut bacteria are a an intermediary between us and our environment. So we can change the way our genes behave. And we can't change our actual genes, but we can change the, what, the way they behave. And that's um, epigenetics, the turning on and turning off and dialing up and dialing down of, of what our genes do, um, of what they make. Um, but the, the great thing about um, gut bacteria is that we can influence them more directly and then they go on to influence um, our bodies. Um, and that's through epigenetics and through our genomes, altering the way our genomes behave as well. So they, for in terms of trying to understand what's going on with, um, with 21st century illnesses, as I call them, and um, with trying to improve our health um, even when we're young, um, I think the gut bacteria has a huge, a huge role to play. Yeah, absolutely. Now l- let's talk about this in a little bit more depth in terms of like this evolutionary, you know, this symbiotic relationship that we've had with, with bacteria. Are they donating genes to us? Are they donating function? Uh, we know they make short chain fatty acids and we talked about things along those lines. Like tell us the major ways that they're contributing to the small amount of genes that we have yet the large amount of proteins and functions that we have. Okay, so um, they probably historically we know that lots of the human genome is made up of genes or gene segments from other organisms especially viruses the way that they contribute mainly is in controlling our immune systems and our immune systems reactions to other things we had assumed that our immune systems decided what to attack and what not to attack based on whether it was part of us or not but the fact that we don't attack things that aren't part of us or shouldn't attack things that aren't part of us like pollen um, or the food we eat that's not part of us but our immune systems shouldn't normally react suggests that actually there's a more sophisticated way of telling what's worth attacking and what's um, worth just ignoring and uh, that the interaction between our microbial genes uh, and our human genes on what to worry about and what not to worry about is probably the biggest way that they're affecting our health. And that goes beyond um, allergies and autoimmune diseases into things like mental health problems and um, obesity and so on. Because if we have, uh, if our immune system isn't calmed down by the presence of these microbes, then um, inflammation develops and inflammation seems to be a big part of mental health conditions and it seems to be a big part of obesity. Um, so to clarify, the um, um, our gut microbes especially are uh, sort of taking a leading role with the immune system. They don't want to be attacked by the immune system. The immune system doesn't want to attack them because ultimately they're contributing to each other's survival. So the uh, when we have a a healthy gut um, microbiota, microbial community, then that community is 
sending messages to the immune system to say, don't worry, calm down, everything's fine, you don't need to attack us. Oh, and see, see this food molecule that's coming in, you don't need to attack that, that's fine too. And it's when that gets out of balance, then they're not there telling the immune system to calm down. And suddenly these things look a bit threatening and, the, and our immune systems get all riled up. Wow, fascinating stuff. And I think that's really important for people to understand that it's controlling these immune you know, set points. Uh, because if you think of every disease from heart disease, you mentioned neurologic disorders, anxiety, depression, autism, mm -hmm. obesity, all these things we can talk about in further depth. Uh, inflammation is at the core of the etiology of mm -hmm. the disease. So that's a really important point to, to clarify that's there. Right. Um, something that keeps coming up that we haven't talked about a lot, but I see it in research is kind of this seasonal change in the composition of the gut bacteria. And we've seen this in hibernating animals. And I would love for, to get your perspective on this. Do our gut bacteria change uh, throughout the season? Uh, there's starting to be hints that they do. There's only been a handful of studies that have followed um, people over the course of, you know, over really long periods of time, over at least a year. Um, but there, there's, there are various suggestions that that might be um, an important part of it. And as you say, in hibernating animals, they change. I talk in my book about um, garden warblers um, who s make a massive dietary switch uh, in order to gain weight before they go on a, a long migration flight um, down to um, sub-Saharan Africa. And um, I think it's worth remembering that a lot of us live in seasonal areas where we wouldn't have had access to some of the foods that we have access to now and that perhaps um, we are not allowing those seasonal shifts to take place or we're overriding them by um, eating the same foods all year round or eating foods that um, are maybe not suitable for a certain season. Yeah. So it would be interesting to find out more about how seasons change the microbiota and how important that is. Sure. Yeah, I've just seen some, I think one or two papers on bears, I believe, um, if I'm if I'm recalling that correctly. So I'd love to see more. So that's that's great. That the story in the book about the warblers is pretty fascinating. And you also get into the book about when you're having a conversation, I think in, in Cambridge with a, a Rachel Carmody, and she's doing a PhD thesis on nutrition. Uh, and she has this epiphany that she's forgotten you know, the gut microbiome and, and how it affects nutrition and then obesity. So do you want to share with us that story and kind of the lessons learned for you? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a it's something that applies to all people studying nutrition now, that for years and years and years, we've worried about what, what happens in the small intestine in nutrition, because that's where our own cells produce our own enzymes and that that breaks down food and the food products then go into our bloodstream. And so we think, oh, that's all done. And then we think of the large intestine as a, traditionally as a place where water is absorbed and where stools are formed. And we don't worry too much about what actually happens in there, what biochemically happens in there. So Rachel Carmody um, um, is fantastically bright and engaging woman and she was doing she did her master's on human nutrition and uh, at the end of her thesis um, defense the examiners slid some papers down this long table and she said they found out in front of her and she could see all the titles said you know microbiome this and uh, gut bacteria that and the the examiner said to her you might want to have a think about how this would affect your results and she said that she read these papers and she just thought, oh, my gosh, I have been studying half of the problem here. And it's not to say that human nutrition, the small intestine element of it isn't important. It's just that what our gut microbes do in our large intestine and elsewhere is also really significant for our, um, our nutrition, for appetite regulation, for um, the way we store energy. And so we really need to take them into account and we need to have a shift in our understanding, in our um, approach to research of nutrition that includes uh, what gut microbes do for us. Mm -hmm. That's a fantastic story. And I uh, myself was working on my master's degree uh, back in 2011 and came across the same thing. And that's, if you look here, the book Belly Fat Effect is all about that relationship between our food and the gut bacteria, because it was, you know, to me, I wasn't being taught this even in a master's degree program, you know, this, uh -huh. this influence. And it's really quite fascinating. So through your work, Alana, uh, what are some of the top foods? Everyone wants to know, like, what do I eat to have a healthy gut bacteria? What have you found to be kind of the high hit rate foods that really increase diversity and increase motility and health of gut bacteria? So um, fundamentally, it's fiber. 
Um, so the more plant plant based foods you eat, um, the better is the general consensus at the moment. Um, and so since I've done my research, I've tried to increase the amount of, of plant fiber in my diet. Um, and I do that by eating more peas because they're really easy to cook and um, really easy to store. So whatever I'm having for lunch, I can have a little bowl of peas on the side. Um, so other high fiber foods include um, onions and leeks and uh, um all sorts of grains, whole grain foods. I've tried to switch more towards whole grain um, and uh, also just leafy vegetables and some fruits as well. So that's the that's the take home message is is just try and increase the amount of food um, that you that you eat that's from plants rather than from animals. And you will inadvertently increase your fiber intake. Mm -hmm. Now, what about TMAO and the trimethylamine oxide and carnitine and all that sort of stuff? What's your take there? Well, I think this stuff is really important and it's going to, it's going to, there's going to be so much more research done on the specifics of it. But I think when it comes to individuals trying to take control of their health, then we shouldn't be worrying too much about the details. Um, carnitine, there's a load of research being done on how it might be affecting our, um, the metabolism of our cells um, and uh, respiration, cell respiration that is not breathing in and out. Um, but we, I think we need to take a step back from that as consumers and just um, focus on having a healthy diet with a lot of plant food in it rather than worrying about uh, tackling individual compounds. Yeah, good perspective. And just to kind of qualify, so people understand when we're talking about TMAO and carnitine, there was a study that came out of, I think, uh, initially a mice study, then they had uh, some humans, you know, ingest meat, uh, and they looked at different uh, metabolites that were made by bacteria than made by the liver. Um, mm -hmm. But in, you know, kind of somewhat a contrast to that study, there was another study, I think it was American Journal of I can't remember exactly. It was actually conducted in, by, in rugby players in the UK, and they had a really high protein diet. And what they right. found is that the high protein was linked with acromanzia mucinophilia. You want to talk about that? Uh, yeah, I mean that that particular study. I think I know the one you mean with the rugby players, where they were. It was it was titled something about exercise, um, and I was a um, I I kind of left that out of my book intentionally because the you can't question what impact exercise has on gut microbes whilst people are on extreme diets. And you perhaps can't question what, what an extreme diet, what impact an extreme diet has on gut microbes whilst people are having an extreme exercise regime. Um, so I didn't, I think, I mean, it's interesting and in that it will lead somewhere, but we need to tease apart the individual effects before we take anything from that. Um, Acomancia was the other part of the question. Acomancia is fascinating. Um, there's a guy called Patrice Carney um, in Belgium who's been studying it a lot and he has come to understand that um, lower levels of acromancia in the gut are associated with a thinner mucus lining and a more permeable um, gut lining, which means that products from inside the gut can make their way across into the bloodstream more easily. Um, and his hypothesis is um, that 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 there's one particular compound called LPS, which coats the um, cells of some bacteria. Um, and he thinks that the LPS is getting into the bloodstream and that is activating the immune system, causing um, inflammation and, try and changing the way that our um, adipose tissue, so our fat cells, um, process energy and deal with whether they should store that energy or, um, or spill it or use it. So he's working on... Um, at the moment, working on whether supplementing with acromancia can um, have an impact on weight loss, which should be fascinating. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah, his research is so fascinating. And mm -hmm. I know one thing, my next question actually was going to be along these lines, looking at dietary fat. I know Patrick Canyon and a lot of his human intervention trials and animal models have preloaded a fat you know, in the diet to as you say, uh, increased absorption of this petroparticulate endotoxin or LPS. So what's your perspective on dietary fat and how it affects this endotoxin absorption? So what I'm really intrigued by is so often when people do high fat diet experiments using rodents, then they're using um, a high fat diet that's really extremely high in fat. 
high fat. So we're talking sort of 60, 70 percent fat when what we might consider a high fat diet in humans is more like 35, 40, 45 percent. Um, so um, I think it's 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 quite intriguing as to whether that's even whether we're really even talking about fat. So one of the things I um, noticed in whilst I was doing my research was that in the UK and in Australia, and particularly in the UK, our consumption of fat hasn't risen that radically over the last 60 years. Uh, and there's been a lot of um, talk that fat and, you know, fat, fat in the diet and um, fat on our bodies are, are correlated. But there's not a huge amount of convincing evidence that that's the case. So one of the most interesting things that Patrice Carney did was that he fed his mice a high fat diet, an extremely high fat diet, and he supplemented it with prebiotics and uh, which is essentially fiber fiber of various kinds and he found that by supplementing with prebiotics um the high fat diet didn't there was there was less of an effect of the high fat diet so the um, gut lining remained tight and lps was less able to get through into the bloodstream and mice were resistant to becoming obese so that's really interesting because it puts the we can't separate out diet and it puts these different dietary components into, um, it makes you realize that they are, they're not independent of one another. And we can't just increase one thing and say, well, because we increased that and this happened, that means that A causes B. <laughs> Actually, we have to take account of what did we decrease in order to fit in the increase? Or did we increase the total amount of food that was consumed in order to fit in that increase? Um, so, I'm really intrigued about the interaction between fat and um, and other uh, nutrients, particularly fiber. Yeah, I think that's a very important qualifier. Uh, you know, talking about you know the fat in context of the whole diet uh, and the polyphenols in particular. I know have been studied along with, as you mentioned, the prebiotics like uh, inulin and, and galacto oligosaccharide. I think is another one that, that Dr. Kenny uses. But uh, the polyphenols are quite fascinating, Alana. I wonder if you've done some research uh, into that. We know that vinegar and berries and curcumin, all these things, when taken with fat, mitigates the endotoxin absorption as well. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I believe lots of them appear to be anti-inflammatory. It's not something that I have um, much expertise on, I'm afraid. Um, again, I kind of come back to the idea that if you're eating plant food, then you're consuming polyphenols alongside um, prebiotic um, substances. So don't worry too much about the details of, of what's in what. Um, I know also that we haven't really teased apart exactly what benefits we get from various compounds within plant foods and we don't sometimes know whether what polyphenols are doing versus what prebiotics are doing and there's a lot of very precise um, nutritional studies that could be done to tease those apart. Certainly. Fantastic. And along those lines about maybe, you know, what is causing what, you talk about a study in your book that uh, uh, individuals that lost weight had improved bacterial diversity. So um, do you think it's possible that our metabolic physiology is somehow, um, you know, communicating with our gut microbiome and then when we lose weight, we see changes there? What in the reverse, whether the weight loss is resulting in changes? It, uh, uh, yeah, it's definitely possible. Um as to the mechanisms, uh, I can't think off the top of my head how they how that might work. But I think that I think there's a um, bi-directional communication all the time. So changes in diet lead to changes in um, inflammation, inflammatory markers, which lead to changes in gene expression, this epigenetics thing again, and those lead to potential changes in our metabolisms. And then there's a feedback. So those changes feedback through that chain and then potentially change uh, what microbes we have. And it just goes around and around. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating, Alana. That's great. So before we finish up, I'd love to kind of get pick your brain a little bit on autism and autoimmunity. We kind of talked about how our gut bacteria control those inflammatory set points, but you have a big piece on both autism and autoimmunity. Do you want to dive into that in a little bit more depth? Okay, so um, autism, um, gosh, where to start? Um, the interesting thing about autism is that it's been noticed that lots of children with autism have gastrointestinal disturbances um, that seem to be, in some, in some cases, much more severe than other children go through, neurotypical children go through. Um, 
I tell the story of uh, an amazing woman called Ellen Bolte, whose um, fourth child uh, developed autism. Um, this is quite some time ago now, because he's now in his 20s. Uh, and she, he did that after having been on a series of antibiotics for repeated ear infections. And I guess she, like me, thought, hang on, what's changed here? What's different? Um, and the doctors at that stage were telling her that he must have been born with autism. And she thought, no, no, I've had three other children and I, I know that he was developing normally and happily. And then this happened and he changed. So she did a lot of research into um, what may have happened as a result of taking those antibiotics. And she came up with a hypothesis that he that the antibiotics had altered um, the microbes living in his gut and that one particular microbe, Clostridium tetani, um, was had started to dominate and was producing um, neurotoxins that were affecting him. And her work, although she was not a biologist and had no microbiological training, um, influenced a um, very uh, well-known, well-regarded um, microbiologist and persuaded him to try looking for whether there are dif differences in the gut microbes of um, autistic children and neurotypical children. And inevitably enough, he found that there were, and lots of people have found lots of different um, representations of gut microbes in, in autistic children and we haven't quite converged on a um, the difference, what the difference is, if indeed there is one single kind of difference. Um, but that has led to lots of other work. So there's, um, there's a woman um, working in at the University of Guelph on, um, in fact there are several, um, on what is different and how those, so what, what do the microbes that are different in autistic children produce? And what do those comp how do those compounds affect, firstly, uh, the way the gut lining uh, behaves? So are these microbes releasing some kind of compounds that uh, perhaps makes the gut more leaky and allows products to get through into the bloodstream that shouldn't be in the bloodstream? And then a second phase of that project will be, are those um, compounds that then get into the bloodstream in some way affecting the development of the brain? Um, there's another person in Canada, uh, Derek McFabe, who's working on whether um, whether a various various combinations of short chain fatty acids and, in particular, propionic acid, are affecting the uh, development of the brain and the immune behaviour in the brain. And and he's found that if you um, give rats um, high doses of, or well, not even that high, but um, increased doses of propionic acid, then uh, they exhibit autistic-like behavior for a short time before the effect wears off. And so he's working on trying to figure out what exactly um, that compound is doing to, uh, to the brain and the immune system as it acts in the brain. Gosh, that's pretty fascinating stuff. And you yeah. take it a step further in your book and, and you talk about how there's gender differences in disease predisposition yeah. and uh, autism is kind of the one that is, you know, traditionally up to now, although I heard it's changing slightly in terms of the prevalence, but I think it's one in 42 boys, a lot higher in boys than girls. And then we look yeah. at autoimmunity and obesity and we look at yeah. asthma and allergies and, and all these different diseases, which we see a higher prevalence in women. Yeah. So any gender differences, uh, maybe in immune set points or gut bacteria uh, that you want to talk about? Yeah, so the, so you're talking about um, in autoimmune diseases, it seems that once um, people pass puberty, then most autoimmune diseases affect women far more than they affect men. Um, so type 1 diabetes is a bit different because that seems to strike teenagers um, around the time of puberty and um, sometimes slightly before puberty. It now strikes at all ages, but that's the majority of them. And that affects roughly the same number of men and women. And then the ones that we, the illnesses that we know are connected to the gut microbiota that strike before puberty seem to affect boys more than they affect girls. So autism, um, yeah, it's, it affects um, about one in eight, uh, sorry, one in 68 children. And I, I think it's, um, I thought it was one in 54 boys. 
Oh, maybe it's 1 in 42. I can't remember. Um, but yeah, so this, there seems to be some influence of hormones. And we've, we've known for a long time that um, female hormones have an impact on the immune system. And some of that may be due to the fact that women have to be able to carry a fetus, which is different from them. And um, they, their immune systems need to not reject that fetus. Um, so we're now starting to understand that there's... Um, that those hormones are affecting gut microbes and that's affecting our immune systems as well. Uh, there's one particularly exciting um, experiment looking at whether, I think, I think what they do if, is they shift gut microbes from male mice who are not prone to developing type 1 diabetes into female mice who are prone to developing it. And that reduces the incidence of type 1 diabetes in the female mice. Um, so that's pretty interesting. So it's really getting to the um, nuts and bolts of how these autoimmune diseases work. Wow, fascinating stuff. And I think we'll, we're at the tip of the iceberg here. There's so much more yet to be uh, unearthed and discovered. And like we started Maybe. off talking about viruses, I mean, pretty soon, I think we'll have the human virome project down the road. Of Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's pretty exciting because, Alana, you're right at the epicenter. I know a lot of the researchers that I follow, you know, on PubMed and Google Scholar, I'm, many of them, if I'm not mistaken, are, are found in the UK. So you're kind of have a nice <laughs> uh, network, I believe. Yeah, it's it's definitely taking off, isn't it? I, a lot of my book is focused on American researchers, actually, but there are a number of them, especially to do with diet, who are um, uh, researching in the UK as well. Fascinating. So anything about the gut microbiome uh, that we didn't get to talk about that you feel is important for our listeners to understand? Oh, good question. Um, well, I guess we haven't talked at all about um, how to make improvements in your gut microbiome other than um, through uh, eating a higher fiber diet. Um, we we know, I mean, my, my major concern would be with antibiotics. We know that um, a huge number of antibiotics are uh, prescribed and taken uh, unnecessarily, um, poss possibly around 50% of all antibiotics prescribed. And um, whilst antibiotics are extremely important, they save lives, they uh, improve lives, uh, we need to be aware that there are potential downsides. And um, as long as we approach them with the understanding that uh, it's not all um, benefit and that there may be some risk and we need to balance that risk according to the situation, uh, then antibiotics could still be, you know, a great tool in our, um, in our arsenal against, um, infectious disease. Um, but, we as individuals can ask questions when we're thinking about taking antibiotics that we should be asking in, in conversation with our doctors. So um, is it possible that I will get better from this infection without taking antibiotics? Could my immune system deal with it on its own? And if I don't take antibiotics, is there a risk of this developing into something more serious? Um, those kinds of questions can save us sometimes from taking antibiotics that we don't need and they're worth asking. Yeah, very important point. Any other medicines? Uh, I know non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs have been looked at in the context of leaky gut and acid suppressants. Any other drugs or pharmaceuticals that uh, you want to put a warning label on because they do possibly affect the gut bacteria? Oh, um, I'm sure there are lots of them that affect the gut bacteria and we don't even know it. Um, but no, I, I think these are conversations that need to be had with um, doctors. And if if your doctor says you could try this drug and you think I would quite like to try another few weeks without this drug and see how I get on and that sounds sensible to you and your doctor, then that's worth considering. Um, but drugs do improve people's lives and save people's lives. So until we've got a really firm understanding of, of what they do and, and what the risks are, then um, it's best to carry on to some extent as we are. Yeah, very important. And also important to share, and you talk about this in your book, that the other source of antibiotics is, of course, our food. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, foods uh, laden with antibiotics, particularly animal products and so forth. And I know Martin Blazier has uh, written and, and uh, yeah. talked about this quite extensively. So 
Well, Alana, uh, this information has been fantastic. We have a couple of final questions, but just want to make sure again that people understand that they can find all the details we talked about uh, today in your book, 10% Human. It'll be at the show notes uh, as well at highintensityhealth.com slash Alana. So uh, one of the things we like to ask every guest on the show, Alana, is uh, their morning routine. We know you're busy, uh, you know, working and writing and researching and you're producing a lot of great quality work. So what is the first couple hours of your day look like? <laughs> Very lazy <laughs> um, I'm fortunate because I'm a writer and I can work from home and I don't have to be in the office at a certain time um, so I I get up relatively late around 8 a.m. Um, and then I slowly make my way downstairs and have a cup of tea of course and um, I have a bowl of, of muesli which I make up myself which is um, oats and barley and um, and then I add to that various kinds of seeds and nuts and um, uh, natural yogurt, milk and um, fresh berries, um, which I grow in my garden, actually. So I go I usually pop outside and pick some berries in the summer, at least. Um, and then I settle down to work, usually get stuck in by doing a bit of um, research on whatever I'm working on at the time before I start writing, because that warms me up a bit. That's awesome. Now, when you're doing research, do you use Google Scholar or PubMed? Share with us a little bit about how you find these great papers. Um, Google Scholar. Yeah, Google Scholar, definitely. Um, I do. I interview huge numbers of scientists um, because they're the source of the information. They know about the context more than what appears in their papers. Um, I read, I read, gosh, um, thousands of papers and my husband is actually a scientist um, and he reads far fewer papers than I do. Um, and I, yeah, I, I do, I do a lot of, I, I think the important thing when you write books like this is not only the science itself, but how that's, that science fits into a context. So what's the political context? What's the social context? What's the historical context? So that leads me into all sorts of different research that is um, off topic from the science itself. But yeah, Google Scholar is definitely my my starting point for anything. Yeah, I love it. I love the alerts. They come like every Friday. I have there's hundreds of alerts from all the stuff I've been reading. Yeah, I get alerts daily as well. Yeah. I want to go through those when I start my day. That's awesome. But what's great about your book and your work is uh, although you read a lot of research and you're you know heavily invested in kind of the academic uh, perspective on what's going on here, you break it down in such a way that anyone can you know, comprehend and, and uh, regurgitate, you know, kind of what you're writing, which is, I think, a huge skill set because it's hard to kind of translate sometimes that complex science into everyday language and you do a wonderful job at it. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's my main aim is to make it meaningful to people. That's the point of it after all. Right. Um, and, to, and to put it into that context that makes it make sense. That's fantastic. So uh, the second final question here, Alana, is if there was one herb, nutrient, botanical, or whole food substance that you just could not live without, you're going to be stranded on maybe Papua New Guinea, and there's just one thing that you have to have, what would that be and why? I'm going to say tea because I'm English and we need tea. So English breakfast tea. Um, in terms of health, um, I I. I couldn't live without grains. I, I'm um, fortunate in that I can tolerate wheat, which I think is a good sign about my microbiome. And I love eating bread. It sustains me um, and I eat enormous amounts of it every day. Um, so that would probably be what I'd want to take. Cool. Okay. So the, uh, the final question here is if you were to ride in an elevator with David Cameron or maybe President Obama or uh, someone from the World Health Organization, and you could just have 30 or 60 seconds to share with them one lifestyle or health tip that you feel would improve the health of the world, what would that lifestyle or health tip be and why? I would like them to put more research into understanding the other effects of antibiotics and looking at whether antibiotics may have a significant role to play in um, obesity, in the obesity epidemic and in the epidemic of allergies and autoimmunity. And um, to understand, to, to, get, to roll out new health information that tells doctors um, how to weigh up the pros and cons of using antibiotics in any given case. Fantastic. That's great, Alana. So I know you're working on a new book and you have, uh, you're have you active on Twitter and Facebook and stuff like that. Share, us, share with us your new work and where our listeners can learn more about you. Um, so my new book is uh, probably going to be called The Warbler Effect, um, which follows on from the Garden Warbler story in um, chapter two of, of my last book. 
um, and it's about uh, the science of obesity and the possibility that obesity is uh, the obesity epidemic is driven by more than just uh, diet and exercise. Um, and uh, I'm active on Twitter. I'm at Alana Collin. Um, and uh, I don't use Facebook, I'm afraid I keep that for personal use. Uh, but yeah, you can always find me on Twitter. Fantastic. Juana, thank you so much for coming on the show and keep up the great work. Thank you very much for having me.